Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Nick Enfield. He is Professor and Chair of Linguistics at the University of Sydney and Director of the Sydney Centre for Language Research. His research on language, culture, cognition and social life is based on long-term fieldwork in mainland Southeast Asia, especially Laos. And today we're going to talk about his latest book, which is Language versus Reality, Why Language is Good for Lawyers and Bad for Scientists. So, Dr. Enfield, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. Thank you very much for having me. So, tell us first about the premise of your book. So, what did you set up to explore there? So, the original premise of the book uh, is that language is both destroyer and creator. And in fact, that was the original title that I had for the book, uh, you know, before the, the final stage. Um, and the idea is that we think of language as this kind of system for coding information, but really what it does is, I mean, of course it does do that, uh, but I was quite interested in seeing how it is on the one hand quite poor at capturing information compared to the experience that we have of the world. So in that sense, it destroys and strips down what we see and what we experience. While on the other hand, being this incredibly powerful tool for creating uh, social reality, for creating social relationships, for maintaining social coordination. So those two ideas that language is a, a destroyer on the one hand and a creator on the other kind of led me as I wrote the book and as I completed it to this, this kind of phrase that uh, language is good for lawyers and bad for scientists. The idea there being that, uh, you know, these are kind of other elements of the same point I was just making. The, the problem for scientists is you're trying to capture the truth. And when I say scientist, it's a, it's a metaphor for, you know, anybody who is seeking the, the facts. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that language strips down and kind of distracts uh, gets in the way of really sort of trying to find the facts. And at the same time, those properties of language help somebody who is a lawyer, that is to say somebody whose goal is to convince people of something, to influence people's decision making, uh, to lure people into their sort of view. Uh, this is no disrespect to professional lawyers. Uh, again, it's a metaphor. Uh, for the idea that um, you know you can you can defend a proposition when you may or may not know whether the proposition is true or maybe not even you don't even care if it's true or not but you take a position and you defend it and language is good for that purpose and in fact part of what I say in the book is that it's really designed for that purpose uh, because it allows us to highlight certain aspects of what we're saying, distract from certain other aspects of what we're saying, all in the name of uh, influencing people and directing their attention to where we would like it to go. Mm -hmm. And in that way, language is connected to reasoning, right? At least according to the evolutionary account of reasoning by Hugo Mercier and then Sperber, reasoning also evolved for uh, much more for convincing people than to getting at the truth, right? Absolutely. Uh, and my account is very much in line with theirs. Theirs, of course, is about reasoning more generally as a psychological process. Mm -hmm. uh, so the framing of their work, uh, talking about their book, The Enigma of Reason, uh, is quite an inspiration to me they are talking about, in a sense, the kind of private psychological processes that one goes through, you know, when you are doing a test in a psychological experiment or you're making a decision based on some limited information. Uh, you know, they have this very nice account where cognitive biases, you know, they look like a real problem when you analyze people's 
cognition from the view that they are processing information to make good decisions. Mm -hmm. And their whole argument is, oh, no, no, that's not really what thinking is kind of evolved for. It's really about um, rationalizing in the sense of coming up with justifications and mm -hmm. thinking about how to convince others and defend one's position. And I think what is really important about that argument is perhaps understated by them. And it's really what I, you know, emphasize in my book is that any function that has to do with justification or defending, those are speech acts. Those are public actions of influence. They're not just merely private actions of cognition. So I think what they pointed to is really important, but it's crucially something that is developed in a social setting rather than in a purely, you know, in a setting of pure kind of reasoning. It's really about the social functions and you can't socialize reasoning if you don't have language in order to carry that. Mm -hmm. But just taking a step back uh, before we get uh, into language specifically, I mean, a language describes certain aspects of what we perceive in the world, but our perception also does not grant us access to the entirety of reality, right? Absolutely, absolutely. That's, that's something that I talk about in the book is this kind of two steps of reduction uh, of reality, if you want to think about language and cognition. So, you know, we live in a very rich universe and there's a lot of stuff going on around us and a lot of it is invisible to a person you know we have these evolved bodies that deliver certain information from our surroundings and other information they don't deliver at all so there are certain things we can't see and certain things we can't hear and there's a lot of impossible perception and uh, on an evolutionary kind of account, those, those things that we can't see and hear have never really made the difference between life and death, if you like. Uh, so, you know, we can leave out a lot of information um, just purely out of kind of computational economy. Uh, so there's this very, very uh, dense reality and we we minimize it a great deal we cut a lot out through our perception and we only perceive a certain sort of small fraction of that that's the first sort of reduction mm -hmm. uh, but then of all the things that we can perceive and all the distinctions that we can make language is uh, again making a massive reduction from that so you know you can see <clears throat> many hundreds of thousands of distinctions if not millions in uh, color but you know, you can't get anywhere near uh, that amount of distinctions in the language for color and, and, and so on. So there's very, uh, very fine perceptual distinctions, which are already a subset of reality, but they are massively reduced once again by language. And I think what's important, what I try to argue in the book is that these two reductions are really doing two very different things. The first one is about reducing complexity for decision making by an individual body in an environment. And that's a sort of a biological evolutionary imperative. And the second sort of reduction is really about what has evolved in a community as a code for coordination. And I'm talking here about the language, the words in a language or the, the idioms in a language. Um, the evolution of our perception and the evolution of our words are, are running on completely different principles, right? One of them has to do with, you know, uh, natural selection from a biological standpoint. And the other one is not uh, based on the individual organism in quite the same way. The other one that is language is really crucially about social coordination. Mm -hmm. Yeah, explain a little bit more that idea of language as a sort of interface for coordination. So one of the points that I've kind of tried to emphasize in my work is that if you look at 
any piece of language, if you are a linguist or an analyst of language and you try to study the meaning of words or a construction that is in language, you have this piece of data that you're observing uh, some person uses the word and you discover it in this language. Well, every single bit of language that you discover is, it only exists because it has been passed on through the history of that community. It's been learned by children in the community and it's continued to be used. If it wasn't being used, you wouldn't have the word, it wouldn't exist, it wouldn't circulate in that community. So if it's being used, it must be used for some purpose. Uh, so any word that exists in a community is, is circulating and every time it circulates, every time a person uses it, they must be, it must be serving some kind of function. And that function has to do with whatever purposes, social purposes that people have at a given time. So it's a very simple example would be some kind of a request to pass some an object. You know, I'm in a kitchen with you and I say, pass me a spoon. And it just seems like a trivial example, but it's a good one because it points to the functional load that language has to serve in order to continue to be used. Uh, every time I use the word, hopefully I succeed with my goal. So in that example, my goal is to get a spoon into my hand and you know, you're standing near the drawer where the spoons are and I use that word. and. So I don't have to be very precise about what kind of spoon, what size I, I can rely on you to understand something about the situation. So with language, precisely because we're coordinating with other people, it's a, it's a public event of using a bit of language to draw you together with me on some, uh, whether it's um, attention to something in the situation or just mutual psychological kind of attention onto something. Uh, this is what, you know, this coordination is what filters language. It, what, it's what selects language. It's what decides whether a piece of language has succeeded or failed. And, uh, you know, if we have words like words for cutlery in our kitchens or words for objects in our everyday life, it's because we repeatedly use them to solve these simple problems. Um, things like, you know, uh, passing objects around. And of course, it's very much more than that. Um, but the real insight I think here is that in, so in cognitive science work on meaning, very oftentimes people talk about concepts and word meanings in, they're just talking about the same thing. They'll talk about concepts, but then they'll sort of give you examples of concepts would be things like dog, cat, table, um, you know, which are nouns from the English language. And my point is that those, sure, those are concepts, uh, but it's really important that they're concepts that have names because the names would not exist if they hadn't traveled in public between people who are in social interaction. Whereas individual concepts in a person's mind don't have to have that. You can come up with a concept that I don't know about and no one else knows about. Uh, you need language to socialize it. Mm -hmm. Is there any sort of straightforward link between the words themselves and the aspects of reality they supposedly describe or even the ideas they denote? Uh, well, I'm not sure what kind of a straightforward link you could be imagining. I mean, this, you know, famous property of human language is that, uh, you know, there's an arbitrary uh, link between which is to say there's no, there's no sensible link uh, between the way a word sounds and the thing that it refers to. So, you know, you can take the word for dog in 10 different languages and uh, it will sound completely different, um, but it's talking about the same thing, it's talking about a dog. And so in that sense, you know, there's no <clears throat> uh, rational link between the, the sound of a, of a word and the thing that it means in general. I hasten to add that there are some really interesting ways in which language can be kind of iconic in certain ways. So if you look at, you know, names for birds, you'll find that they very often will have uh, a name that kind of sounds a little bit like the sound of the bird or, um, you know, other more subtle 
effects in language. So there definitely is what you call iconicity in language. Um, and that is one kind of a, uh, a motivated link between a word and the thing that it refers to. Uh, but that, I think that principle is relatively weak in language. It's certainly there um, because language allows us to just um, arbitrarily decide we're going to call this thing by this word now. And even if it's motivated or not motivated, people can immediately learn that and then it's a, it's a convention. So I think that's really the key about language is that it's a convention. Um, and you can only really understand the concept of convention if you think in terms of social coordination, right? Because we come to an agreement about what we're going to call something uh, or what something is going to represent. And then from then on, we don't have to negotiate it anymore. We just take it for granted. And that's what conventions really uh, are for. They, they solve uh, a problem of computational complexity. We just, we solve it once, we don't have to solve it ever again. So essentially a language is just a giant set of conventions in exactly that sense. Um, and, and, and conventions are in a large part, a product of a, of a collective agreement. Mm -hmm. Is there loss of information when we translate from one language to the other? Well, I think anybody would say, yes, of course. Um, I, I, I cannot see how you would fail to lose information from one language to another. I mean, uh, you can tell me if you disagree, but I think anybody who speaks more than one language has a very strong intuition that many words, maybe all words, uh, have different meanings in their details. They might have different uh, connotations and nuances. Even the way that they sound can evoke different feelings. Uh, so it depends a bit on what you mean by information. If you if you wanted to, if you were asking specifically about, you know, the semantic content of words. Uh, just with that, yes, there's massive differences between languages in the semantic content of their words. I mean, arguably, 99.9% .9 of their words have different different semantics. So you have to make choices when you're translating, and uh, you're always necessarily introducing a little bit of meaning and leaving out a little bit of meaning. Uh, and that's just in terms of the kind of referential meaning, the the uh, the semantic content of words, what what the, what the words mean. There's other kinds of information, which is not about, you know, the objects or actions that we're referring to, but information about the speaker, uh, about the social relationship, about the kind of emotive aspects of what I'm talking about, and of course the language I speak, uh, the choice of la what language I speak will also introduce information of that kind. Uh, so, you know, I think there's a, a massive amount of information is, is lost and added in and swapped and transformed and uh, warped every time you uh, move from one language to another. Do you think that uh, it would be possible for us humans to coordinate without language? Yeah, yeah, I do. Uh, I, I think it's obvious that we can. Um, you know, you can go to a place where people don't speak uh, the language that you speak and using hand gestures and uh, eye gaze and uh, things like that. You can, you can readily coordinate with someone. Also, you know, there's more subtle ways in which we coordinate. You could be walking down a street on a, on a, in a, big city and you sort of move a little bit to the left, a person coming towards you moves a little bit to their left and then, you know, you, you, you pass by without bumping into each other. That would be arguably um, an act of coordination uh, because you take each other into account as you, uh, you know, as you walk past each other. So that would be coordination with that language. I think there's something important here and that is while we can coordinate with that language, there's a really fundamental part of human coordination that really requires language, and that is accountability. So when we coordinate our actions, it's not that we just sort of uh, pass by without bumping into each other, you know. Um, that, that's sort of part of it, but it's, it, 
coordination becomes much more interesting in human life when it's regulated by accountability. And by that, I mean that you enter into an agreement with someone to uh, to coordinate in a certain way to solve a problem in a repeated fashion. So, for example, we drive on, you know, the right hand side of the road and that way we don't bump into each other. But there's a penalty for dri riding on the other side. Uh, the obvious penalty is that you would hit another car and have an accident. Um, but at the same time, you also need to uh, have other kinds of penalties like fines and, and, uh, and that kind of thing. And when it comes to language, we do have penalties in the form of accountability. If you use words in ways that are not uh, aligned with the conventions, then you, you can be held accountable. You can be said to have lied. You can be said to have misled people. Uh, and that is, uh, I think, a really important feature of linguistically mediated coordination. Uh, and that is that even if you're not speaking while you're coordinating with each other, if something goes wrong, then you can use language to regulate and to mediate um, the coordination itself. So, I mean, I think one of the things I talk about in the book is the way in which language is, is what allows you to build social reality. And this draws on work by the philosopher John Searle, who makes a very strong case uh, that social reality is, is created by a human language. You can't have human social reality without human language. And I think that that's true insofar as we're talking about accountable coordination, right? So that means that you're using language to set up an agreement, the kind of convention we're going to follow here. Um, but also crucially, and this is something that John Searle doesn't really talk about, crucially, if the agreement it goes wrong, you can invoke language to point to that. So one of his examples is um, property rights, basically. So, you, you know, you put a a line between this bit of land and that bit of land and you say that's mine and, and this is yours and that verbal act uh, just pronouncing those words this is mine is a kind of declaration that creates its own reality so I, I then have rights over this little bit of land um, and you can create a coordination around property rights without um, language in a sense so I might put my jacket on a chair in a library and I haven't said anything in words but I, it's a way of kind of claiming uh, some temporary ownership over that place uh, and what's important is that that claim doesn't just say I own this spot but it means I have the right to hold someone accountable for trying to take this spot over I'll say oh hey that's my spot that's my jacket there and I need to use language to <laughs> invoke that unspoken agreement. So a lot of our non-linguistic coordination is actually like that. I think that it is done in a kind of abbreviated form, but under the surface, there's always the possibility of bringing language into uh, police the coordination in some sense. Mm -hmm. So if different languages capture different aspects of reality, uh, where, does, where does that come from? Is it because people, uh, languages evolved in different environments where people have to pay attention to different aspects of reality rather than others to survive and reproduce? Is that it? Well, that's part of it for sure. So I think that what you're talking about is, you know, this idea that when you look at different languages around the world, uh, so, you know, there's 7,000 different languages spoken in the world and many others that have been spoken in the past. And sometimes they have really very different vocabularies and different sets of meanings that they would uh, encode. So one language, in one language, there might be a very uh, rich vocabulary for uh, plants and life forms that grow in the forest. And uh, in another language, you might find that people know a very small number of plant names and that might correlate with where the people live and what sort of lifestyle they have. So in some environments, you might find 
uh, a lot of biological diversity in the local setting, you know, the people live in a forest, and in the other environment, not so much diversity, people live in a big, big city. But it's not really a very direct kind of relationship. Uh, so there's sort of more, it, it, it's a more subtle kind of question than that. So you can go to places where people live quite close to nature, but you'll find that if, if, a, if a group of people are hunter gatherers, uh, roughly the average number of plant names that they will know might be around 200. Um, whereas if you go to a group that might live in a similar sort of environment, but they're cultivators, so part of their lifestyle is to, to, to uh, grow food for themselves and grow plants for themselves and, you know, get seeds and plant them and cultivate them, they will know probably two or three times the number of plant names. So there's a, a kind of a demonstrated correlation between not so much directly from the environment, but more to do with the lifestyle and, and the concerns that people have and the kinds of activities they engage in. And that's what I, I really try to emphasize in the part of the book where I talk about this. And that is that, you know, the having a elaborated part of your language is not just a direct product of, of perception of what you see around you. Uh, it comes back to this point about coordination. It's not only that you're interested in some aspect of the world as an individual. The crucial thing for language is that you must be motivated to use that word for some social coordinative purpose. Otherwise, the word would not circulate. So, you know, as an individual, I might live in a forest and I might be fascinated by, you know, little uh, uh, perceptual distinctions I might make between different types of leaves and different types of, you know, uh, sh shoots and different species of plants. But if I don't talk about them, then those words will never circulate. So it's really not about purely or it's not primarily about how I perceive the world or what. I happen to have in front of me in my envi environment. The key for, thing for language is that I must have a reason to use those distinctions when I'm coordinating with other people. So it comes back to this argument that I've been making about how language is a kind of self-advertising, self-assembling kind of system. Uh, and it assembles itself through usage. So I'm talking, I, I like to quote this little line from Dan Dennett's book, Darwin's Dangerous Idea, where he says that the, the idea of a wagon with wheels, uh, you know, it, the wagon with wheels does not only carry a load from place to place, it also carries the wonderful idea of a wagon with wheels. So a piece of technology can advertise itself, people see it and they go, okay, I can use that. So I can go and build one for myself or get one for myself or create one for myself. And language is just like that. So when you use a word for something, uh, not only does the word, you know, bring about some kind of communicative function, but it also advertises itself and other people can see, oh, okay, I can use it for that purpose. And then later they will get an opportunity and that keeps the word circulating within the uh, community. And uh, invariably that p the purpose that we're speaking about when it comes to language is the purpose of social coordination. It's the purpose of influencing others, um, affecting their behavior, affecting others' decisions so that they can then, uh, you know, either do something in collaboration with you or perhaps help you in some way. And language is the tool we use for bringing that about. But because different languages might focus uh, more or less on different aspects of reality, is it that some of them uh, are better at and convey richer information about uh, certain aspects of reality than others? Yeah, I think that's clearly true. It's just empirically uh, known that some languages allow their speakers to, to be more precise about certain kinds of things. Uh, so uh, the work that's been done um, uh, 
by my former colleagues, uh, Nicholas Burnholtz and Asfa Majid, for example, on smell distinctions in different languages would be an example of that. Um, so we have this incredible sense of smell. We can smell a massive uh, variety of distinctions, a massive number of distinctions, but most languages have very small vocabulary. And that's an example where people have studied uh, languages that have a bigger vocabulary than say English um, in terms of you know basic uh, terms for different smells. Dutch would be another example, like English, of, of, of a language that's pretty poor. It doesn't have a lot of ways of talking about smell. Speakers don't uh, agree that well on how smells should be described. Whereas in um, languages like uh, the Jahai language of um, Peninsular Malaysia, you find that there are many more words for smells and they're used in a much more consistent and sort of useful way by the speakers of those languages. Uh, so the answer to your question is yes, indeed, that would be just one among many examples of how uh, languages can allow you to be, one language will allow you to speak in a more detailed, fine-grained way than another language about uh, a particular domain. That doesn't mean, of course, that you can speak with great clarity about that domain. I mean, I, the, the example I just gave you is the difference between, you know, two words and 10 words for smells, whereas we actually have, you know, hundreds of thousands of uh, noticeable differences in smell that we can perceive. And the same goes for things like color and, and you know, especially in the visual um, domain. So we find in any specialized domain uh, I've been talking about just sort of everyday language or the kind of language that any native speaker of a language would know. Uh, but if you just look at any specialization, um, there are words for objects. You know, you walk into a mechanics shop and, you know, you pull apart a car engine and there are all these objects, all these pieces, I don't know, I don't even know what they are. Uh, but a mechanic will have a very fine vocabulary for referring to those different parts and they'll have a you know, very fine vocabulary for referring to, you know, an object that you show me 10 objects, I say, oh, that's a bolt or, you know, that's a screw or some simple word like that. And I'll say, well, actually, no, there are 10 different things here and they can give you the, the term for each of those things. So uh, specialization um, which typically comes from division of labor is going to uh, be manifest in, in sort of in, in, in the linguistic, the level of linguistic detail and granularity that is provided in a language. And I should emphasize that you get these differences in granularity between languages, but you also get it, and maybe even more so, between areas of a single language. So there's no two people who really know the same words in a language, you know, you test people in different parts of Portugal to see how many words they know in Portuguese, you find quite different numbers, depending on their, uh, what job they have, what age they are, other sort of aspects um, of who they are and what they do will correlate with, uh, you know, sometimes very different uh, linguistic knowledge. Mm -hmm. So, uh what is priming and what sort of psychological effects does it have? Well, uh, priming, I mean, this is a big field in the psychology of language uh, that is not my area of expertise. Uh, but in the book, I talk about, you know, the basic idea of what priming is and how it works in relation to the idea that language can be used to mess with other people's heads in some sense. <laughs> so basically the phenomenon of priming is where you hear, a, um, let's say you hear a word. Uh, let me, let me give you an example. So, uh, you know, if you are looking at a, a picture, I give a diagram in the book, um, uh, from Kate Box's work on priming, where she shows people in an experiment a picture that shows uh, 
a church on a hill and then there's a cloud in the sky and a lightning bolt is hitting this church. And you ask people to just describe what they see. And, uh, you know, this is a, this is a piece of, um, it's, it's a linguistic production problem for the individual in the experiment. They have to decide, okay, what am I seeing here? They're visual, they have to look at the scene, they have to identify the elements in the scene, the relations between them, then they have to encode these in words. And then they have to decide how to structure those words. So this is a case of kind of what's called syntactic priming. Um, and so if I prime you with some information about uh, that, that, that draws your attention to the church, so for example, uh, you know, I use the word worship and you hear the word worship just before you see the picture. Uh, it draws your attention more to the church. And, and when you describe it, you'll say the church is being struck by lightning. Mm -hmm. uh, but if I say instead, you know, thunder, something that kind of draws your attention to the, to the lightning, you'll say, uh, you describe the same situation um, as something like, um, you know, lightning is striking the church. So there's a, the difference is between lightning is striking the church and the church is being struck by lightning. They both have the same elements, but one is the active form and one is a passive form. So what I've done there uh, by using those words just before you saw the image and just before you were given the task of describing it was to prime you, that is to sort of push you in one direction um, or, or in another direction. So that, that's priming for kind of decision making and how we describe something. Another really simple example is, you know, um, I show you a photograph. This is kind of very basic psycholinguistic research. I show you a photograph of an object and your task is just to name the object as quickly as you can. Uh, you know, so I show you a guitar and you say, guitar. Uh, and this all happens, with, you know, in uh, less than a second. Uh, now, if I show you another picture just before you see the guitar that is shaped like the guitar, like a, a tennis racket, or that has some, even better, it has some uh, functional similarity to the guitar, like a violin, uh, you will actually produce the word guitar more quickly. You will be primed that this, that the word guitar is somehow activated in your mind, and then you're able to uh, perform the task of uh, accessing that lexical item. Uh, more quickly. So priming, there's a couple of examples of priming where uh, the basic phenomenon is that you are uh, using some bit of preliminary information that uh, either distracts or sort of heightens the awareness of a person to some part of the scene or to some way of thinking about the scene or some aspect of what's, you know, where their attention is in their mind, which then affects uh, their interpretation or it affects their production or somehow their performance of their decision making uh, when they're using language. So these are experimentally controlled kind of effects. But I think what's interesting about them is that if you can see those effects in an experiment, those effects are happening all the time when we are in conversations, right? So every time a word is being used, it's pushing us this way and that way in terms of what we're paying attention to. And then as we respond, we're being, you know, our responses will have been to some extent affected by whatever we were just primed by. Mm -hmm. So do you think that, for example, when certain political activists uh, are worried about the language people use to refer to, for example, minority groups of disadvantaged people, that they are right to worry about that and perhaps try to uh, linguistically frame things in a new way and care about the kinds of words people use to refer to those people? Well, I think yes and no. It's it's interesting because you get two kind of very strong reactions to to these questions. I mean, the, the, the question you've raised has to do also with what we would call framing. Mm -hmm. These two things are very closely related. Uh, I mean, you could argue the same thing, really, that framing um, is a choice you make about how to describe something. And we're talking about political activists will 
be quite concerned often about what is the appropriate way to describe a certain situation. Mm -hmm. And I think one critique of that is to say, well, you, you know, you can't control the way I speak and, uh, you know, you can choose to, to describe things any way you want. And anyway, I'm not being um, inaccurate. And so, you know, don't try to control my uh, language for political reasons. But th at the same time, you can <clears throat> come back and say, well, you know, there's actually something quite important about the kind of ethical dimensions to this. So, I mean, one example would be looking at uh, one of the examples that I talk about in the book is looking at the language that is used around uh, the reporting of domestic violence in newspaper articles. So there's uh, a, a wonderful book by Jane Gilmore called Fixed It, where she looks at how, you know, headlines in news stories about uh, often incidents where a man murders uh, his partner and sometimes his children, um, these will be reported in these kind of strange ways. Like uh, an example that I give is something like um, man dies in cliff fall, uh, you know, with, with two children. Uh, and when you read the story, you find out, well, the man murdered his wife and then murdered the children and then they all jumped off the, you know, uh, uh, threw them off the cliff. It's a terrible story. Um, and the point there is that, you know, it, the way that it's framed in the headline does not reflect the, what happened. Now it's not false in that example I just gave, it's not false to say that the man died in a cliff fall. Uh, it's still a true description of the facts, but um, there's an ethical argument which says, you know, you should be including certain information. Um, so in that kind of case, I'm certainly on the side of those who would say, you know, certain things should be said and certain things should not be left out when you're trying to describe a situation uh, because you can never be truly neutral about how you describe a situation. I'll give you another example, which is from again, from a legal setting. Um, so one of the examples, I, I, I can't remember if I talk about it in the book or, or in another context, but um, there's a case where uh, it's a court case and uh, a woman uh, who's alleged to have been raped is being uh, cross-examined and is being asked about uh, the events of the evening prior to uh, the, the rape and the lawyer who's examining her says, uh, he sat with you, or let's say it's in a kind of pub or something like that. So he sat with you and the woman says, he sat at our table. And those two expressions, he sat with you versus he sat at our table, they seem like almost the same. Uh, but there's a sense in which they're really importantly different, right? So sat sitting with you implies that you are a part of a group together, that you had a, you know, your friends or a collective unit. He sat at our table is a way of talking about it that simply speaks to not the social uh, connections between the people, but just the physical description, mm -hmm. right? So th those are two ways of framing the same situation and arguably they would be priming certain ways of thinking about the situation, right? Sitting with you versus sitting at your table kind of invoke different, different ideas around what was going on. And obviously in this case, uh, this goes to the subtitle of the book, you know, language is good for lawyers. That choice of words, he sat with you, is one way of framing the situation that helps the lawyer to build the case that, you know, the woman was involved with the man in some way and, and so on and so forth. So you, you, you get the idea. I think that uh, the argument that we need to be careful about the way we speak, you should really focus on cases like that. Uh, I think that oftentimes when people argue about, you know, political correctness in speech and things like that, they're, they're often talking about pretty trivial 
uh, kinds of examples that people get upset about. Uh, I don't know. So one of the examples I talk about in the book is Easter worshippers. So there was um, a horrific uh, attack in Sri Lanka uh, where um, uh, many people were killed in shootings in churches on at Easter in Sri Lanka. And uh, several U.S. politicians tweeted out messages about this and referred to the people who died as Easter worshippers. And conservatives in the U.S. got very upset because they said they're not Easter worshippers, they're Christians. Why are you avoiding saying the word Christian? Uh, you know, uh, so there was a kind of a culture uh, war kind of uh, news cycle around that. But it's an interesting case there where, you know, you will always get kind of, I think that's like a pretty trivial case because it's not at all clear that people were trying to avoid using the word Christian. I mean, I think that's a kind of an uncharitable interpretation, but I think there's plenty of examples uh, like the domestic violence cases and the, the courtroom cases where that's that's not really the issue at all. So there's there's an important distinction between more consequential uses of language and more, um, what's the word, emblematic uses of language. So, you know, we like to use words not because we like to use certain choices of words, not because they're more accurate, but because they tell you something about me and who I uh, align with. Mm -hmm. Do you think that people who manipulate others consciously or unconsciously make use of these features of how we process language like priming mm -hmm. and framing? Oh, yeah, undoubtedly. I think that that's really what good influencing is all about. So, you know, language is, I think it's important to remember that language is fundamentally runs on the same principles as any form of animal communication. Uh, so, you know, the famous, there's a famous article uh, by Krebs and Dawkins in the 1980s, which lays out a theory of communication that says communication in animals is a device for manipulating the other, exploiting the other to use their uh, muscle power for your benefit. So it might be things like, you know, uh, an angler fish has a little... <laughs> Uh, light there and uh, you exploit the attention the interest of the other creature to get it to move into your mouth You don't have to do anything. You just catch them um, and so You know anybody who is using language as a tool like uh, an advertiser or a lawyer or uh, Just a person gossiping or you know so many things that we do in life uh, That's a lot of the time what we're doing. We're trying to direct people in a certain way Often that is to our benefit. It might also be to their benefit. So oftentimes it's cooperative, but it, it, sh it should always be to our benefit or it will likely be to our benefit. Um, and so if you become skilled at influencing others, that's really going to be the essence of that skill is going to be in uh, using language in a clever way. Uh, and, and, and you will probably not know the word priming and you will probably not necessarily have looked at that research and know those principles or the framing work. Um, but uh, uh, you certainly will be using it because that's what brings about effects. So in it, actually marketers will probably know quite a bit of this work, uh, certainly framing um, through the behavioral economics work, uh, famous work by people like uh, uh, Tversky and, and Kahneman, who've looked at how you can uh, push people's decision making and their kind of reasoning this way or that through uh, the word choice that you make. And so there's very, you know, there's a lot of research that's really looked at, at that, um, this field that's referred to as nudge theory um, and framing. Uh, and so certainly <clears throat> marketing people are aware of, of that and I mean, I think good marketing people just intuitively know those principles and use them. Uh, there's, there's, there's no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and people like politicians and people from the media also use framing to their, particularly in the case of politicians, to their advantage, right? Absolutely. You know, you can look at any successful campaign. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think actually Donald Trump was a good example of that, um, you know, because he was uh, quite good at finding turns of phrase and finding, um, for example, he had nicknames for all of his opponents and he would just repeatedly use these nicknames, use these nicknames, you know, what it was a sleepy Joe Biden or something, uh, who's now um, president. And, you know, I thought that was interesting that he was very attentive to these kinds of ways of framing or, you know, the fake news media is another one. So instead of just saying the media, you'll always refer to it as the fake news media. Uh, it's obviously not just Trump. All politicians uh, do this and that's what they're advised to do. And, uh, you know, repeating when we talk about messaging uh, and repeating the message over and over, that's typically what what people mean is that, you know, you have a way of framing the situation, which is, which is. Uh, comes down to word choice. So it's interesting if you look at the framing literature, it's not, there isn't a strong connection between the framing literature in, 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 in psychology and behavioral economics and just, you know, linguistic semantics, although there should be. Uh, it's, it's kind of surprising that that link is not, is not really explicitly there. When it comes specifically to the media, do they really report the news or do they rather construct it? And what does that mean exactly? Well, I think there's no doubt that the, that the media construct the news. Firstly, simply because that's the nature of language. I mean, nobody ever does anything other than construct an account of what's going on. So when I tell you uh, you know, at the dinner table about what happened in, uh, in my day. I'm constructing an account of what happened. I'm necessarily leaving out some details. I'm necessarily choosing, you know, to emphasize certain parts of what I saw and not mention certain other parts or, or you know, I'm necessarily choosing different, different uh, words. Um, those aspects of language will never go away okay so you know it, 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 it's just impossible to simply report the facts you're always choosing from among infinite alternatives maybe not infinite uh, but you know there's always different ways of saying something so you are always making a choice now the que your question specifically about the media might be well maybe you didn't mean that maybe you're thinking about you know whether this choice was kind of conscious so often we look at the newspaper and we think, okay, the, the editor of the newspaper has a kind of political uh, agenda. And, uh, you know, you can imagine an editor instructing their uh, writers, you know, this is the term we use for that. That's the term we use for this. We don't talk about, we don't mention those news articles. We emphasize these news, art, news articles. Whether that is said in an explicit way or whether it just becomes part of the culture, sure, I think that's going on. Uh, but I would say that that's what's going on in any human society already. You know, any human interaction is going to have that feature that you're constructing what you say to other people, uh, that there are ground rules about what's interesting to talk about, what's not interesting to talk about, what will engage people, what will not engage people. Uh, that doesn't mean that, you know, the media are innocent. Uh, you know, obviously there's a decline, you know, there's the media outlets that really strive to uh, be, you know, objective and to strike a middle ground and to be ethical. And there are those that are very uh, partisan. Um, but I think that you see a similar range in kind of media discourse that you see in, 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 in everyday language use among humans. Mm -hmm. So framing is inevitable. So it's impossible to be not framing something when you talk about it. You're always making a decision about how to describe it that will highlight certain things and not others. And if you look at the uh, 
architects of the kind of nudge theory, which is basically grounded in in, in the concept of framing. Um, uh, Cass Sunstein has a paper where you know he makes this point very clearly: is that you you cannot have a known a non-framed uh, uh, version of events. You know you are always making a selection, and so I I think that's a really important realization to make because. You know, one interpretation is therefore, uh, I just say what I like because I don't have any kind of, uh, I'm always going to be framing in some way, so you just have to kind of accept it. I think that's not the right kind of conclusion. I think the right kind of conclusion is therefore, we need to be more mindful about how we use language. We need to be more mindful given that we know the effects that our use of language will, will have. And, you know, we don't have much time to be mindful, right? We're talking all the time. Uh, words come out at this incredible rate. We're constantly using language and we don't have much time to reflect, but we can reflect sometimes. And what that means then is we need to be sort of mindful of the fact that there are no default uh, unframed versions of events. And so when, when it's important, to acknowledge or to kind of be aware that there are alternative ways of describing a situation, we should acknowledge that and we should, you know, uh, try to actually describe something in three different ways just in order to have some kind of, let's say, uh, viewpoint diversity within the context of a description. So, you know, when you're having a conversation or whether you're reporting a story, uh, what this suggests is that you know, coming at something from a few different angles is a healthy thing to do. And our best tool for doing that is in the language we choose. Mm -hmm. Do you think it would be in any way possible to develop a more quote unquote objective language? Well, perhaps you could, but it would be at a great cost. I mean, you know, it, it, it goes to the famous work by George Orwell, uh, 1984, where he kind of lays out this vision of a, of a totalitarian government that, that tries to control the language. And um, a lot is lost when you do that. Uh, so, you know, I don't, uh, in that sense, no, you know, I don't think it's possible because you lose too much. Uh, diversity is important. Diversity of perspective is really important and you need to be able to encounter different ways of describing the same situation because, I mean, it's basically part of just, you know, liberal science and, and rationality. You need to see something described in different ways before you can kind of uh, question your own way of understanding something, right? So, so seeing something described in different ways is actually healthy and important. It, the, the key thing is not to have it described in the same way all the time. And that's the kind of, you know, danger of uh, something like, you know, the, the totalitarian kind of uh, changes in language. Having said that, um, if you think about functions of language that are connected to areas of specialization uh, in a kind of economy with or a culture with division of labor and highly specialized kind of uh, work. Yeah, you can have very fine kind of objective language that is a good idea. So I don't know, um, air traffic control, you know, there's, there's, there are very strict kind of ways of speaking for air traffic control so that, you know, you don't cause planes to crash into each other or hit the ground, you know, too hard. Uh, and so there've been rules developed over time to be very strict around how you refer to moving, you know, from one altitude to the next and, uh, and this kind of thing. So, uh, also, I don't know, mathematical language and, uh, any, any kind of language where the consequences are very, uh, concrete, <laughs> you know, you've really got to get, you've really got to get the language right. That's exactly the right context where you want to insist on some kind of uh, un, non-negotiable kind of convention. But in most of life, negotiating how we see something is a healthy thing. It's a good thing. And it's important to kind of 
uh, expose everyone, especially yourself, to different viewpoints on something. And so, so being mindful of that and looking for different ways to describe the same situation are actually healthy things to do. At a certain point in your book, and perhaps this takes us at least to some extent all the way back to the beginning of our conversation, you say that public discourse, rather than being a market for ideas, or as some people put it, a marketplace of ideas, is mostly a market for justifications. Could you explain that? Yeah, that term is uh, really from Hugo Mercier's work, that way of talking. Uh, and so, you know, he he makes this claim in the context of his wonderful book, Not Born Yesterday, uh, where he's talking about, uh, you know, the 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 way in which we should think about the circulation of information in 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 media uh, and what people are doing when they adopt a position you know they 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 look at the news and they say oh i believe x or i believe y mm -hmm. um and his point there is saying well you know you have to think about how it's not the case that people are being kind of brainwashed to believe uh, you know, whatever the media tells them or something. Actually, people have beliefs uh, at some level. There are things that they want to believe. And this is, uh, of course, you know, the confirmation bias that we are so <laughs> suffer from so much. If you have a confirmation bias, if you're, if you're committed to a certain way uh, of thinking, when we evaluate information, which is typically presented to us in, in the form of language, um, you know, the, the kind of scientific approach would be to say, how can this get me to be closer to the truth? So how might I be wrong? And how could this new piece of information help me to correct myself? You know, if you take a kind of Karl Popper approach to, uh, to knowledge, but you know, people just don't think that way. You know, that's a very sort of a classical idea of how science works would be to sort of think that way. Uh, instead of being in discovery mode, we're in defend mode most of the time. And that means that, you know, we're not we're not looking to be have our minds changed. We're not looking to learn what we're doing is looking for uh, new bits of information that we can use uh, to uh, to defend our position. So this goes back to the, the, the Sperber and Mercier uh, work that you mentioned earlier on. Um, again, I'm pointing out that this idea, their argumentative theory, as they put it, is basically amounts to this point, um, is not just a theory of cognition, it's a theory of what motivates us to communicate in certain ways, right? So it's it's not just privately in your mind, but it's in, in the language you choose for the interactions that you want to have. Uh, so that's how, you know, that's why I want to say that we're in a market for justifications, because you're looking at all of the language around you, and you're seeking to grab hold of something that you like that you can then use to defend the position that you have. You can give reasons why you want to believe this certain kind of uh, statement. And that's really the lawyer's sort of position. Um, so as a lawyer, uh, in a metaphorical sense, you're looking to ignore or push away uh, ways of saying things that would actually prime people to go in a different direction from what you want them to go on. What you're looking for are, 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 are ways of describing things um, that will be more likely to influence people in the way that you want. And that's a purely strategic kind of stance. And it's a very uh, understandable and appropriate one for a lot of what we do in everyday life, right? Uh, but of course, our, our lives are quite diverse. And sometimes the uh, information that we take on and that we spread uh, can have really bad consequences. And that's obviously uh, what the problem is in this sort of modern uh, media discourse, fake news and, and, and all that kind of thing. But but this this answers your question about the idea of a market for justifications. And I, I think it's a really important insight of, of people like uh, Sperber and Mercier that any sort of hope 
for a kind of liberal science, you know, rational view on uh, on the circulation of good quality information in the interest of knowledge has to kind of grapple with that uh, dual status of, of information that flies around in the form of language. Either we can use it to to learn something and to get closer to the truth and to critique our own way of seeing things, or we can grab it and use it to defend our position. And clearly, you know, what I'm saying, particularly at the end of the book is, you know, it's, it's, it's really in our interest to take that first path. Mm -hmm. Let us now talk a little bit about stories. That is another topic that you explore in the book. Uh, what are yeah. the elements of stories? What characterizes them and what distances them from reality? Yeah, so uh, it's interesting. So the, the, the whole section of the book is about stories. And uh, I've spoken to quite a few people. Maybe we just run out of time every time, but I haven't had much opportunity to talk about the section of the book that's about stories. Uh, but it's a really important part of the overall argument. Um, so the argument, as you asked me earlier on, is really about how language distracts you in the, on the one hand um, and takes away from reality in some certain ways. But on the other hand, it, it's constructive. It's this force that builds, that adds to our lives in these interesting ways and creates this you know, creates new realities, creates relationships. And stories are really important in this whole, uh, in this whole argument. So stories, you ask sort of what are the elements of them? Well, there are a couple of things that people will always say. So there's a lot of literature about stories and, uh, you know, every culture has stories mm -hmm. and people tell stories all the time. And I don't just mean like Hollywood films and novels, but, you know, I will tell you uh, over the dinner table, you know, something about what happened in my day. And that would be a, a little story. So stories, one of the things that stories often have, particularly these everyday stories, uh, like what happened in my day or something happened on the bus or, you know, something my experience I had on the weekend. Oftentimes those stories will feature some departure from what is normal in our everyday lives. So someone did something crazy, something surprising happened, something terrible happened. Uh, what I will typically do in an everyday kind of story is to present to you uh, some disruption from the normal course of life. And that's, uh, that's a really important feature of stories and it allows you to, firstly, to sort of socialize what are the things that we regard as being normal mm -hmm. and what are the things we regard as being strange or disruptive. Uh, also, it allows me to, you know, update you on things that are happening in my life. We continue, we share information. So it's very much a social investment you know you share information about my experiences now but also in the moment you get to align with me around how i feel about what happened so i might tell you a story about what somebody did on the weekend and i think this was terrible behavior and i tell you the story and then if we are aligned with each other then you will react in the same way as i do i give you an opportunity to say oh you know that's terrible i i you know i take the same position as you and you can do that in all sorts of ways. And it's a tool for us to align with each other kind of socially. So there's a there's a whole world of functionality for little stories that we tell through the course of everyday life. Then there are the uh, stories in the much more kind of in the sense that people often think when they hear the word story, they might be thinking about narratives. Uh, novels, you know, Hollywood screenplays, that kind of thing. They will also include a, a lot of kind of moral content around what's normal and what's not normal and what's good behavior and bad behavior. So a very strong kind of element of cultural norm uh, advertising in some sense and negotiating also a little bit. Um, but they also have very uh, interestingly rigid set of features in their kind of structure. So, you know, you almost always get uh, a single 
character who's who that who you're following from the beginning of the story who is somehow lacking uh, and need has a need that they need to fill. Uh, typically, they have some very concrete task that they're trying to solve. Uh, you know, they need to. <laughs> get out of danger, they need to cross uh, some boundary, you know, the, the, every movie has this kind of feature where the person has a goal and they need to reach that goal by the end of the film. And you, you follow through all the difficulties that they uh, have. And it goes uh, typically over and over again, they come up against these obstacles and you get absorbed in this, this uh, pursuit of their goal. And in the end, they reach that goal or, or somehow the film comes or the story comes to resolution. But crucially, the main character is then undergoes some kind of transformation uh, and changes into a new. They might become, you know, they were a boy and now they become a man or they were, you know, single and now they're not single anymore. There's typically some kind of transformation that they will undergo and, and movies are very different in what that transformation is. But those features, the protagonist the journey, the transformation, those things are, are, are very strong in stories across the world and they're argued to be part of the kind of fundamental grammar of human uh, storytelling. So all of that's very interesting kind of psychologically in terms of what, uh, you know, what we're processing when we're processing stories. But I think what's important from my point of view is that, they, is that those features about stories are what, transport the hearer and what grab onto the hearer and they create this opportunity for for uh well manipulation of the audience you're really capturing their attention you're really capturing their emotion um but also kind of construction of of this kind of notion of sense making this idea that we're socializing <clears throat> what is normal what's unusual what's good behavior what's bad behavior what is you know what what are the consequences of our actions and so forth mm -hmm. uh, could you tell us about this idea of story as simulator so there's an idea that stories particularly thrilling stories of novels and uh hollywood screenplays and epic stories there's a there's a really interesting question around what function they perform in society and uh, why do they exist and you know what good are these stories what's the purpose of them mm -hmm. and w this idea of story as simulator is one of these hypotheses that says uh, okay let's look at the content of stories what they're like if we compare them to you know everyday life uh, so a recent study uh, that I talk about in the book showed that, uh, you know, the frequency with which people get murdered is massively higher in stories than it is in everyday life. So if you take an average person and, and you ask what is the likelihood that would get murdered, uh, you know, there's a likelihood, but it's very small. Um, but if you look at, uh, take any character in a novel, you know, much higher likelihood they'll be murdered at some point and uh, so on for all of the other kind of ordeals. Uh, so if you look at movies, look at novels, it's very often the case that the characters are going through these intense ordeals. Uh, they're, they're, you know, there's a lot of danger, there's a lot of, uh, you know, murder and <laughs> much more intense things happen than would happen in our normal everyday life. And, uh, you know, the question, of course, is why? Why is it that we are looking at these kind of incredibly intense uh, e events and, and stories? And, and one argument says, well, it's like a simulator for the mind that you are able to experience that in a, in a, at a, in a certain way and you're able to get into the mindset of someone who's going through those experiences and you're able to imagine and perhaps well in the sense it's like a flight simulator right you're, you're kind of you get transported by this and you actually can train your mind a little bit and your decision making and your emotions around you know what would you do in that situation and that is somehow useful because of course you might you know, we all get into dangerous situations at some point, 
Uh, but we don't want to train in truly dangerous situations, right? We want to learn uh, what we might do or what we should do in ways that are not going to be dangerous to us, right? So there are many other things in nature that try to avoid you know, in animal communication, for example, in fighting, signaling for fighting among animals, very often what animals are trying to do is to avoid fighting, but to just, you know, signal that I can beat you, so don't fight me. And then if you can avoid a fight, then, you know, everyone wins. So it's a little bit like that, that you can actually somehow gain from the experience of someone else's ordeal without having to actually go through the ordeal yourself and undergo the danger. Um, that's kind of the basic idea behind it, and uh, you know, behind the sort of simulator for the mind idea. And you see that, you know, with Hollywood movies, what's well, kind of random, right? Who knows what kind of uh, uh, dangerous situations we might find ourselves in? It's probably not going to be like a Hollywood movie. But you get a lot of storytelling, for example, between parents and children. Mm -hmm. And parents, if you look, you know, there's, I talk about in the book about a study where parents, uh, the, the, the researchers looked at the kinds of stories that parents tell to their children. And, you know, they're typically about formative experiences, important decisions that the parents made, experiences that they had where they, uh, you know, essentially they don't want their kids to go through those same experiences. They want their kids just to go straight to the lesson. <laughs> Right, and not have to um, have the risk, uh, you know, of, of of the danger there. Similarly, I look in the book at sort of myths that get passed down from generations that also have to do with averting uh, dangers. So I talk uh, in the book about the stories that are passed around in areas close to the sea, uh, for example, around the Pacific, so in Japan. Uh, where where there are traditional stories that instruct you if you see the sea run out, then you should go to higher ground. So there's a story where, you know, uh, an old man sees the sea run out and all the people go down to look <clears throat> what's going on. Then he goes up to his house on the hill and sets his house on fire. And uh, then all the people from who are down looking at the, the, the empty sea come running up to help put out the fire and that's when the tsunami wave comes up and they are all saved because they went up to the to the house so this is a classic case of a of, a, of an old myth an old story that uh, has some of the elements of storytelling uh, but it also has this kind of a very important practical lesson uh, that in, it, it is a sort of spoon fed lesson in some sense. So it's not really exactly a, uh, you know, simulator for the mind in, in the same kind of way, but it has that element of imparting some of the crucial knowledge people would be able to acquire without having to go through the experience themselves. So if you're an animal, uh, you know, animals can communicate all sorts of things, but this is the exact thing that animals cannot communicate. They can't, you know, non linguistic forms of communication do not have this property of what we call displacement, which is the ability to talk about something that happened at a different place and time. And that ability is just it's this incredible, uh, it's incredibly creative force, right, that really sort of brings us uh, into, into alignment with each other and allows us to share information that reduces costs for others. Uh, and give you lessons that we've learned through going through those ordeals ourselves. Mm -hmm. And what is sense making and is it related in any way to stories and narratives? Yeah, sense making is, I, I think I might have used that term before and I certainly talk about it in the book that the kinds of effects of storytelling that I was just discussing are part of sense making. So sense making really refers to, it's actually quite hard to define what that means, but basically, you know, you imagine a lot of what we do in the world, you know, you, you if you go to a place, a foreign place you've never been to before. So I, I work in Laos, uh, in Southeast Asia, many of the things that, uh, 
you would see if you have never been to Laos, if you travel there for the very first time, you'll see a lot of things happening around on the streets and in the villages. You don't know what's going on. Mm -hmm. You don't know who is doing what. You see people dressed in a certain way. You don't know why. There's a lot of things you simply don't notice. There's activities happening. There's things being sold and you don't even know what's inside these kind of packages. It's just all these questions and puzzles. You don't know what's going on. Um, if you live there for a while, little by little, you have these experiences and oftentimes those experiences come from stories that you start to see, oh, that's what that is and that's what this is and that's what that's what that role is and that's what that person is doing when they do that. Uh, so it takes time living in a culture to make sense of what's happening, to see sense making is really understanding just kind of what is going on in front of you, but also understanding reasoning. Mm -hmm by which I mean literally the reasons why people do things uh, and also the kind of evaluations that we have of what people do. So what's a good thing to do, what's a bad thing to do, um, what's acceptable and so on. And stories play a really important role for the reason I said earlier on that very many stories are precisely about a kind of disruption to the fabric of normal, unremarkable everyday life. Uh, and 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 telling a story in that way draws your attention to exactly that kind of the surface of everyday life where, you know, you know how to interpret what's going on. Nothing is surprising you, but occasionally that surface is broken and that's what makes uh, a story relevant to tell. And that would be, you know, one way of, of invoking sense making through storytelling. Mm -hmm. So there's one thing I haven't asked you about yet, that is the mm -hmm. Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. Uh, and uh, I would like also to ask you to please tell us what it is exactly about, because I know that sometimes it's misunderstood. I know it's related to the idea of linguistic relativism, but what is it and do you have any position on it? Well, the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis uh, is a few different things. It all depends on who you ask. And certainly uh, there are different versions of what it means. The basic idea, if just in a nutshell, typically people will say that the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis states that the language you speak changes the way you think. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you uh, one person speaks English, another speaks person speaks Portuguese, another person speaks Hopi, uh, you know, they, they will think differently because they, uh, they speak these different languages. Now, in one sense, you know, nobody would argue with this. It's kind of obvious, right? Oftentimes we think in language and um, we use the categories that the different languages give you. And so in some sense, yes, our thoughts can be different because of uh, the language. But if you look at the original claims by, uh, by B Benjamin Lee Whorf, well, it's kind of a little bit more nuanced than that. So there's a superficial sense possibly that simply by speaking another language, our, our thoughts are different in some sense because we, you know, some of the time we can think in words. If you read the work by Benjamin Lee Whorf, so it's, you know, Sapir, Whorf, Hypothesis, Whorf is the, the Whorf part, and he was a, a linguist from the first half of the 20th century. Uh, he was trained by Edward Sapir, also a linguist and a famous uh, anthropologist of, of native North America. They were both very interested in, the, in human diversity and in what they were seeing in these cultures and these languages that were very different from uh, European languages, which kind of dominated the science of language up to that time. So they were discovering the languages of, of Native American people and uh, and realizing that you could describe the word in a very different way using uh, these other these other languages. So it was kind of for them uh, a way of seeing the world differently. And in some places, Wolf and Sapir as well, both kind of made comments that said something like, well, you, you know, if you speak this other language, you know, space and time will be different for you. Uh, so there are some really quite strong statements that 
many people reject, you know, and they'll say, well, that's kind of, that's kind of crazy mystical stuff, you know, space and time, it's all the same. <clears throat> Language is not going to change that. Uh, so, you know, there's an extreme position, which people don't really support. Um, you know, then the other position is, you know, the language you speak makes absolutely zero difference uh, to your thought processes and nobody would really say that either. So the question is, well, it's not like, is there an effect of language on thought? It's like, what is the effect and how strong uh, is it? So if you go beyond those kind of very few quite strong statements by people like Wolf, uh, one thing I talk a bit about in the book is his famous discussion of the way in which he believed language was affecting the thought processes of people uh, in these cases that he was studying. So he used to be a, a fire insurance inspector and he noticed that people were making errors in kind of factory or work settings and these errors were leading to fires um, uh, starting and he proposed that their use of language was possibly a factor in this. Uh, so he gave examples like you know, there were some uh, uh, fuel drums which used to have, they were full with fuel and the fuel was used up and now they were empty and they were marked empty. Uh, but people used smoke cigarettes around that space because they thought it was safe, the drums were empty, but actually they had vapor and they exploded and this caused a fire. Or another example, uh, people were careless with uh, this substance called spun limestone. Uh, so, you know, stone sounds like it's just rock, it would never burn, but actually it's a substance that does that does burn and, uh, and people were not um, safe using this substance. And he gives similar kinds of examples. So what I think is really interesting about that is it's kind of two things. One is that it's a kind of priming and framing effect that gets people to think about what they're seeing in a certain way and it draws their attention away from uh, things they might not be paying attention to. So if you categorize something as a kind of stone, then uh, if you don't know any better, then you're going to apply the same kind of reasoning that you would apply to stone. It's a simple effect of categorization. You throw out certain information and then you can reason using the, the bit of information that's left. Uh, so, so that's one piece of it is that you're actually kind of discarding information through categorization. Uh, and I think that's one interesting piece is that there's a kind of psychological effect of categorization through things like, like priming and so on. Um, the other piece I think is really important is that coming back to points I made earlier on about language as a, uh, a source of justification, you asked about the market for, for justifications. Uh, and we've been talking about language being good for lawyers. What's really interesting about the Wharf's examples that people don't talk about much is that they are elicited in a context of exactly that. It's a it's people justifying their actions, people explaining to the insurance inspector, why were they careless with cigarettes around those uh, drums that have fuel vapor? Well, then they, they, they give an account using language. They say, oh, well, they were empty. Or they say, oh, well, it was limestone. I didn't think it was going to burn, uh, et cetera. And so it's not simply a psychological process of reasoning. It's also uh, how, do, how do I use language to reach for a justification for my behavior that's going to uh, do the job, that's going to you know, mean that I will not be uh, convicted of a crime or, or, you know, that I will not lose my insurance coverage or something like that. Uh, I talk in the book about uh, several other e sort of legal examples. And I think that the, the, this is part of the Wharf story that is not really talked about very much, the strategic use of language for actually justifying action rather than purely the idea that, that linguistic thinking is uh, that we're sort of like a slave to linguistic thinking. So uh, to come back to your question, you know, there's a very strong version of the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis that people, not many people really uh, unquestioningly support. And that is the idea that we're kind of prisoners of our language. We can't possibly think beyond that. 
That's not true. But there's also plenty of evidence that uh, through exactly these kinds of effects like priming, overshadowing, framing, nudging, all of these things which are completely accepted in, uh, in uh, you know, behavioral economics and, and, and uh, cognitive psychology, those things are driven by language, right? They're driven by specific differences within uh, a language like English. Well, if you can drive cognitive processes, if you can prompt and nudge decisions one way or another by a choice between two words within a single language, then you know, it follows that because we know different languages are semantically structured differently, that you're going to be able to nudge people in different directions based on which language they, they're, they're speaking, right? And just because you have a variation within a language that can have the same effect doesn't mean that you don't have uh, linguistic relativity effects. Um, they're there, but they're a species of a higher or of a, let's say, a broader kind of effect, which is really fundamentally comes down to framing, uh, whether you're framing, the differences in framing are drawn from choices you have inside a language or choices you have across languages, those, those functions are going to be there. And I think, I mean, on this point, one thing I'd want to say is that the question around framing, there's really two sources of variation, right? If I frame a situation in a certain way now, one source of variation is my uh, intention right now in this interaction. I can choose different words right now. Okay, so I could be, uh, I could take that view, I could take this view, I could frame it that way, I could frame it this way. So that's one sort of context for, for variance in framing. Another context is a, a more historical context, a more historical frame. Right, all my choices right now, so we're speaking English, all my choices come from uh, the history of the English language and all of the communities that have used it. And so the, the choices that I have now are contingent upon the choices that others have made uh, previously, right? And that set of choices is different for every single language. So English has tons of choices that it gives us based on its history. But, you know, as I said earlier on, there are thousands of other languages spoken in the world. So each one sets the conditions in a way for what's possible within a set of possible framings in a, in a, in a given language. And that's really the source uh, of, of linguistic relativity effects. Mm -hmm. So one last question. Uh, do you think it's possible for us to determine what would be the best way of talking about things, the best words to use in particular areas and with particular goals in mind, like, for example, within the domain of science, uh, getting at the truth, describing reality as objectively as possible? I mean, do you think uh, we can do that and we should do that? I think I would reiterate what I was arguing earlier, which is that we need to combine a mindfulness around the effects of language and the fact that language is not objective. We need to, we need to be mindful of that on the one hand, mm -hmm. and we need to combine that with a willingness and an active pursuit of diversity in how we frame things. So I think looking for objectivity is obviously good and important if you want to design a technology, for example, that you know you want to design a bridge that won't fall down, or you want to design a telescope that will, uh, you know, fly a million miles from the earth. You know, the, the, you need to know facts in order to make these things happen. There's no doubt about it. Um, but those facts come from the scientific process and the scientific process crucially relies on, uh, well, I guess what Popper would refer to as conjecture and critique, that you have to have some imagination, you have to throw around diverse ideas, you have to think from different angles around a problem and you have to critique the 
ideas that are coming out. And so that means you've got to, both of those ideas point to diversity in framing, diversity in how we talk about things, diversity in the words that we select on any given occasion. So I would not want to see a drive to, you know, demand that this uh, phenomenon be referred to in this way every time uh, because that goes exactly against this kind of liberal scientific principles um, of, of self-critique, of constantly questioning one's position uh, because you can't, you know, you never get a final objectivity, you never get a final picture of reality, and so you have to keep alive all of the different viewpoints around it. And language is a wonderful tool for doing that. Mm -hmm. Very well. So uh, the book is, again, Language versus Reality, Why Language is Good for Lawyers and Bad for Scientists. I will be leaving a link to it in the description box of the interview. Dr. Enfield, just before we go, would you like to mention any places on the Internet where people can find you and your work apart from the book? Uh, sure. Well, I... I'm on Twitter a little bit, uh, NJ Enfield. You can find a few little things there. I have a website, nickenfield.org, and uh, the, my books and papers are accessible there. So um, please go take a look if you're interested. Okay, great. So thank you so much for your time, and it's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very much. It's been a great conversation. Thanks. Hi guys, thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing and to help me keep the channel sustainable, please visit my Patreon page or PayPal and consider making a pledge there. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share the interview, leave a like and hit the subscription button. The show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke, and Blanchett, Perugo Larson, Laguerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, Adam Kessel, Olaf Alec, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Henry Calenia, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connor, Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Ruth Gruvoz, Bo Weingard, Rebecca Newburger, Goldstein, Dan Demetrio, Robert Windega, Rui Nassio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Mark Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Colombo, Jorge Pinha, Phil Cabana, Mark Blythe, Roberto Iguanzo, Mikkel Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Dugny, Alexander Dunbauer, Fergal Kassen, Yevan Bodrenko, Hal Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Leibrand, Oslin Bullet, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Eines, Mark Smith, JW, João Weira, Tom Hamel, Dable Sloan Wilson, Yasil Adesa Araujo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dermiti Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roff, Yannick Punter, Adana Ruzmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostazewski, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hellman, João Linhares, Lida Cosmidi, Saima Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paulo Tolentino, João Barbosa, Jules Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litska, Denise Cook, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, and Todd Shackelford. My producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Stafinia, Kian Gilligan, Luis Caetano, Tom Vanegdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Giddy, Sardis France, Thomas Trumbull, and Nuno Welder. And my executive producers, Michel Ruzieski, Rosie, James Pratt, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Codriano, and Bogdan Kanivets. Thank you for all.